Elsa Reads A Game of Thrones by George Martin Chapter 28 Caitlin My lady, you ought to cover your head, Sir Roderick told her as their horses plodded north. You will take a chill. It is only water, Sir Roderick, Caitlin replied. Her hair hung wet and heavy, a loose strand stuck to her forehead, and she could imagine how ragged and wild she must look, but for once she did not care. The southern rain was soft and warm. Caitlin liked the feel of it on her face, gentle as a mother's kisses. It took her back to her childhood, to long grey days at Riverrun. She remembered the godswood, drooping branches heavy with moisture, and the sound of her brother's laughter as he chased her through piles of damp leaves. She remembered making mud pies with Lisa, the weight of them, the mud slick and brown between her fingers. They had served them to Littlefinger, giggling, and he'd eaten so much mud he was sick for a week. How young they had all been. Caitlin had almost forgotten. In the north, the rain fell cold and hot, and sometimes at night it turned to ice. It was as likely to kill a crop as nurture it, and it sent grown men running for the nearest shelter. There was no rain for little girls to play in. I'm so through, Sir Roger complained. Even my bones are wet. The woods pressed close around them, and the steady pattering of rain on leaves was accompanied by the small sucking sounds the horses made as their hoofs pulled free of the mud. We will want a fire tonight, my lady, and a hot meal would serve us both. There is an inn at the crossroads up ahead, Caitlin told him. She had slept many a night there in her youth, travelling with her father. Lord Hoster Tully had been a restless man in his prime, always riding somewhere. She still remembered the innkeep, a fat woman named Marsha Haddle, who chewed sour leaf night and day and seemed to have an endless supply of smiles and sweet cakes for the children. The sweet cakes had been soaked with honey, rich and heavy on the tongue, but her Caitlin had dreaded those smiles. The saw leaf had stained Marcia's teeth a dark red and made her smile a bloody horror. An inn, Sir Roderick repeated wistfully. If only... But we dare not risk it. If we wish to remain unknown, I think it best we seek out some ho small hold fast. He broke off as they heard sounds up the road, splashing water, the clink of mail, a horse's whinny. Riders, he warned, his hand dropping to the hilt of his sword. Even on the king's road it never hurt to be wary. They followed the sounds around a lazy bend of the road and saw them, a column of armed men noisily fording a swollen stream. Caitlin reined up to let them pass. The banner and the hand of the foremost rider hung sudden and limp, but the guardsmen wore indigo cloaks, and on their shoulders flew the silver eagle of sea guard. Malistus, Sir Roger whispered to her, as if she had not known. My lady, best pull up your hood. Caitlin made no move. Lord Jason Malister himself rode with them, surrounded by his knights, his son Patrick by his side, and the squires close behind. They were riding for King's Landing and the hands turning, she knew. For the past week, the travellers had been thick as flies upon the King's Road, knights and free riders, singers with their harps and drums, heavy wagons laden with hops or corn or casks of honey, traders and craftsmen and horse, and all of them moving south. She studied Lord Jason boldly. The last time she had seen him, he had been jesting with her uncle at her wedding feast. The Malisters, Sir Bannerman, to the Tullys, and his gift had been large. His brown hair was salted with white now, his face chiseled gone by time, yet the years had not touched his pride. He rode like a man who feared nothing. Kate didn't invite him that. She had come to fear so much. As the riders passed, Lord Jason nodded a curt greeting, but it was only a high lord's courtesy to a stranger's chance met on the road. There was no recognition in those fierce eyes, and his son did not even waste a look. He did not know you, Sir Roderick said after, wondering. He saw a pair of much better travellers by the side of the road, wet and tired. It would never occur to him to suspect that one of them was the daughter of his leech lord. I think we shall be safe enough at the inn, Sir Roderick. It was near dark when they reached it at the crossroads north of the great confluence of the trident. Masha Haddle was fatter and greyer than Caitlin remembered, still chewing her saw leaf, but she gave them only the most cursory of looks with nary a hint of a ghastly red smile. Two rooms at the top of the stair, that's all there is, she said, chewing all the while. They're under the bell tower. You won't be missing meals, though. There's some things, it's too noisy. Can't be helped. We'll pull up or near as makes no matter. It's those rooms or the road. It was those rooms, low, dusty garrets at the top of a cramped, narrow staircase. Leave your boots down here, Marsha told him after she'd taken the coin. The boy will clean them. I won't have you tracking my mud up my stairs. Mind the bell. Those who come late to meals don't eat. There were no smiles and no mention of sweet cakes. When the supper bell rang, the sound was deafening. Caitlin had changed into dry clothes. She sat by the window, watching rain run down the pane. The glass was milking full of bubbles, and a wet dusk was falling outside. 
Caitlin could just make out the muddy crossing where the two great roads met. The crossroads gave her pause. If they turned west from here, it was an easy ride down to Riveron. Her father had always given her wise counsel when she needed it most, and she yearned to talk to him, to warn him of the gathering storm. If Winterfell needed to brace for war, how much more so Riverrun, so much closer to King's Landing, with the power of Castle Rock looming to the west like a shadow. If only her father had been stronger, she might have chanced it, but host of Tolly had been bedridden those past two years, and Caitlin was loth to tax him now. The eastern road was wilder and more dangerous, climbing through rocky foothills and thick forests into the Mountains of the Moon, past high passes and deep chasms of the Vale of Erin and the Stony Fingers beyond. Above the veil, the eyrie stood high and impregnable, its towers reaching for the sky. There she would find her sister, and perhaps some of the answers Ned sought. Surely Lisa knew more than she had dared to put in a letter. She might have the very proof that Ned needed to bring the Lannisters to ruin, and if it came to war, they would need the errands and the eastern lords who owed them service. Yet the mountain road was perilous. Shadow cats prowled those passes, rock slides were common, and the mountain clans were lawless brigands, descending from the heights to rob and kill and melting away like snow whenever the knights rode out from the vale in search of them. Even John Arryn, as great a lord as any of the Eyrie had ever known, had always travelled in strength when he crossed the mountains. Caitlin's only strength was one elderly knight, armoured in loyalty. No, she thought, Riveran and the Eyrie would have to wait. Her path ran north to Winterfell, where her sons and her duty were waiting for her. As soon as they were safely past the neck, she could declare herself to one of Ned's bannermen and send riders racing ahead with no orders to mount a watch on the King's Road. The rain obscured the fields beyond the crossroads, but Caitlin saw the land clear enough in her memory. The marketplace was just across the way, and the village a mile farther on, half a hundred white cottages surrounding a small stone sept. There will be more now. The summer had been long and peaceful. North of here, the King's Road rang along the green fog of the Trident, through fertile valleys and green woodlands, past thriving towns and stout holdfasts, and the castles of the River Lords. Caitlin knew them all, the Blackwoods and the Brackens, ever enemies, whose kraals her father was obliged to settle, Lady Wend, last of her line, who dwelt with the ghost in the cavernous vaults of Harrenhal, irascible Lord Frey, who had outlived seven wives and filled his twin castles with children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren and bastards and grand bastards as well. All of them were bannermen to the Tullys, their swords sworn to the service of Riverrun. Caitlin wondered if that would be enough if it came to war. Her father was the staunchest man who had ever lived, and she had no doubt that he would call his banners. But would the banners come? The Darius and Ridges and Mutons had sworn oaths to Riverrun as well, yet they had fought with Rhaegar Targaryen on the Trident while Lord Frey had arrived with his levies, while after the battle was over, leaving some doubt as to which army he had planned to join. There, he assured the victory solemnly in the aftermath, but ever after her father had called him the late Lord Frey. It must not come to war, Caitlin thought fervently. They must not let it. So Roger came for her just as the bear keys its clangor. We had best make haste if we hope to eat tonight, my lady. It might be safe if we were not knight and lady until we passed the neck, she told him. Common travellers attract less notice. A father and daughter taken to the road on some family business, say. As you say, my lady, said Roderick agreed. It was only when she laughed that she realised what he'd done. The old courtesies die hard, my, my daughter. He tried to tuck on his missing whiskers and was sighed with exasperation. Caitlin took his arm. Come, father, she said. You'll find that Masha Haddle sets a good table, I think. But try not to praise her. You truly don't want to see her smile. The common room was long and draughty, with a row of huge wooden kegs at one end and a fireplace at the other. A serving boy ran back and forth with skewers of meat, while Masha drew beer from the kegs, chewing her saw leaf all the while. The benches were crowded, townsfolk and farmers mingling freely with all manner of travellers. The crossroads made for odd companions. Dyes with black and purple hands sharing a bench with rivermen reeking of fish, an ironsmith thick with muscle squeezed in beside us while wizened old septon, hard bitten sellswords and soft plum merchants swept news like boon companions. The company included more swords than Caitlin would have liked. Three by the fire were the red stallion badge of the Brackens, and there was a large party in blue steel ringmail and capes of a silvery grey. On their shoulders was another family sigil, the twin towers of Horse Frey. She studied their faces, but they were all too young to have known her. The senior among them would have been no older than Brown when she went north. So Roderick found them in an empty place on the bench near the kitchen. Across the table, a handsome youth was fingering a woodhop. Seven blessings to you, good folk, he said as they sat. 
An empty wine cup stood on the table for him. And to you, singer, Caitlin returned. So Roderick called for bread and meat and beer in a tone that meant now. The singer, a youth of some eighteen years, eyed them boldly and asked where they were going and from whence they had come, and what news they had, letting the questions fly as quick as arrows and never pausing for an answer. We left King's Landing a fortnight ago, Caitlin replied, answering the safest of his questions. That's where I'm bound, the youth said. As she suspected, he was more interested in telling his own story than in hearing theirs. Singers love nothing half so well as the sound of their own voices. The hand's tourney means rich lords with fat purses. The last time I came with more silver than I could carry, I would have if I hadn't lost it all betting on the Kingslayer to win the day. The gods run on the gamblers, said Roderick said sternly. He was of the north and shared the dark views on tournaments. They're frowned at me for certain, the singer said. You cruel gods and the night of flowers altogether did me in. No doubt there was a lesson for you, said Roderick said. It was. This time my combal champion, Sir Loris. Sir Roderick tried to tug at whiskers that were not here, but before he could frame a rebook, the serving boy came scurrying up. He laid trenches of bread before them and filled them with chunks of brown meat of a skewer dripping with hot juice. Another skewer held tiny onions, fire peppers, and fat mushrooms. Sir Roderick said to lustily as the lad ran back to fetch some beer. My name is Marillion, the singer said, plucking a string on the sword top. Doubtless you've heard me play somewhere. His manner met Caitlin's smile. Few wandering singers ever ventured as far north as Winterfell, but she knew his life from her girlhood in Riverrun. I fear not, she told him. He drew a plaintive chord from the wood hop. That is your loss, he said. Who was the finest singer you've ever heard? Arlia of Bravos, Sir Roderick answered at once. Oh, I'm much better than that old stick, Marillion said. If you have the silver for a song, I'll gladly show you. I might have a copper or two, but I'd sooner toss it down a well than pay for your howling, Sir Roderick rose. His opinion of singers was well known. Music was a lovely thing for girls, but he could not comprehend why any healthy boy would fill his hand with a harp when he might have a, had a sword. Your grandfather has a sore nature, Marillion said to Caitlin. I meant to do your honour, an homage to your beauty. In tooth, I was made to sing for kings and high lords. Oh, I can see that, Caitlin said. The Tully is fond of songs, I hear. No doubt you've been to Riverham. A hundred times, the singer said airily. They keep a chamber for me, and the young lord is like a brother. Caitlin smiled, wondering what Abba would think of that. Now the singer had once bettered a girl her brother fancied. He'd hated the breed ever since. And Winterfell, she asked him. Have you ever travelled north? Why would I? Marillion asked. It's all blizzards and bearskins up there, and the Starks are new music, but the holding of wolves. Distantly, she was aware of the door banging open at the far end of the room. In keep, a servant's voice called out behind her. We have horses that want stabling, and my lot of Lannister requires a room and a hot bath. Oh, God, Sir Roderick said before Caitlin reached out to silence him, her fingers tightening hard around his forearm. Masha Haddle was bowing a smiling, hideous red smile. I'm sorry, my lord, truly, but full up every room. There were four of them, Caitlin saw. An old man in the black of the night's watch, two servants, and him, standing there, small and bold as life. My man will sleep in your stable, and as for myself, well, I do not require a large room, as you can plainly see. He flashed a mocking grin. So long as the fire is warm and the star reasonably free of fleas, I am a happy man. Marsha Haddle was beside herself. My lord, there is nothing. It's a tourney. There is no help for it. Oh, Tyrion Lannister pulled a coin from his purse and flicked it up over his head. Carter tossed it again. Even across the room where Caitlin sat, the wink of gold was unmistakable. A free ride in a faded blue clo cloak lurched to his feet. You're welcome to my room, my lord. Now there's a clever man, Lannister said as he sent the coin spinning across the room. The free rider snatched it from the air. And a nimble one to boot, the dwarf turned back to Master Haddle. You will be able to manage food, I trust. Anything you like, my lord, anything at all, the innkeeper promised. And may he choke on it, Caitlin thought, but it was Bran she, was, she saw choking, drowning on his own blood. Lannister glanced at the nearest table. My man will have whatever you're serving these people. Double portions, we've had a long, hard ride. I'll take a roast form. Chicken, duck, pigeon, it makes no matter. And send up a flagon of your best wine. Joran, will you sup with me? Aim, lord, I will, the black brother replied. The dwarf had not so much as glanced toward the fair end of the room, and Caitlin was thinking how grateful she was for the crowd of benches between them, when suddenly Marillion bounded to his feet. My lord of Lannister, he called out, I would be pleased to entertain you while you eat. Let me sing you the lay of your father's great victory at King's Landing. 
Nothing would be more likely to ruin my supper, the dwarf said dryly. His mismatched eyes considered the singer briefly, stared, started to move away, and found Caitlin. He looked at her for a moment, puzzled. She turned her face away, but too late. The dwarf was smiling. Lady Stark, what an unexpected pleasure, he said. I was sorry to miss you at Winterfell. Marillion gapped at her, confusion giving way to chagrin as Caitlin rose slowly to her feet. She heard Sir Roderick curse. If only the man had lingered at the wall, she thought. If only... Lady Stark? Marcia Heddle said thickly. I was still Caitlin Tully the last time I batted here, she told the innkeep. She could hear the muttering, feel the eyes upon her. Caitlin glanced around the room at the face of the knights and sworn swords and took a deep breath to slow the frantic beating of her heart. Did she dare take the risk? There was no time to think it through, only the moment and the sound of her own voice ringing in her ears. You in the corner, she said to an older man she had not noticed until now. Is that the black bat of Harrenhal I see embroidered on your circuit, sir? The man got to his feet. It is, my lady. And this lady you went, a true and honest friend to my father, Lord Hossel Tolly of Riverrun. She is, the man replied stoutly. So Roderick rose quietly and loosened his sword in its scabbard. The dwarf was blinking at them, blank face with puzzlement in his mismatched eyes. The red stallion was ever a welcome sight of Riverrun, she said to the trio by the fire. My father counts Jonas Bracken among his oldest and most loyal banner men. The three men at arms exchanged uncertain looks. A lot is honoured by his trust, one of them said hesitantly. I envy your father all these fine friends, Lannis equipped, but I do not quite see the purpose of this Lady Stark. She ignored him, turning to the large party in blue and grey. They were the heart of the matter. There were more than twenty of them. I know your sigil as well, the Twin Towers of Frey. How fares you good lord, sirs? The captain rose. Lord Waldo as well, my lady. He plans to take a new wife on his nineteenth name day, and he has asked your lord father to honour the wedding with his presence. Tyrion Lannister sniggered. That was when Caitlin knew he was hers. This man came a guest into my house, and there conspired to murder my son, a boy of seven, she proclaimed to the room at large, pointing. Sir Roderick moved to her side, his sword in hand. In the name of King Robert, and the good lords who serve, I call upon you to seize him and help me return him to Winterfell to await the king's justice. She didn't know what she was most satisfying. The sound of a dozen swords drawn as one or the look on Tyrion Lannister's face.